Um, my name is Shannon Bailey, and I'd like to welcome all of you today. I'm very excited to introduce Dr. George Dean in person. Um, I'm the chief curator here at the World Chess Hall of Fame, and we are celebrating our fifth anniversary this fall, this year. And um, one of the reasons we have another Dean show, we had one as soon as we opened. Um, it, it was an amazing show, highlights from the collection of Dr. George and Vivian Dean. And the second that exhibition closed, everyone asked us where it was, when's it coming back. We had people come two or three years later to come see it. It was back at his house. <laughs> and uh, Rex Singfield and, and Jeannie, who are so generous and make all of this chess camp as possible, um, had said over and over again, we've got to get George Dean sets back in this building. So we thought what a great way to kind of commemorate our fifth anniversary year, but to kind of look back at some of those first shows that we did that year. So it was very easy to think, um, how can we bring back these exquisite chess sets and give it a tiny little twist? Well, we're honored to have Larry List here, who was the curator of that first show. He's also the curator of the show downstairs, which I'm sure you've all seen, which is Animal, Vegetable, Mineral, Natural Splendors from the Dr. George and Vivian Dean collection. So in a second, I'm going to introduce Larry, who will then introduce Dr. Dean. Um, this exhibition commemorates the 55th year that the Deans have collected chess sets together. They purchased their first chess set in the Middle East and thereafter acquired a set in each country they visited. As they immersed themselves in chess history and joined a worldwide community of chess set connoisseurs, they expanded their collection more systematically. Now they travel to new countries for the sole purpose of acquiring new sets to make the collection more comprehensive. Their collection includes and this is true, 1,000 chess sets and related objects from over 100 countries. And Dr. Dean and uh, Vivian collect more than just chess sets. They've got an incredible art collection as well. The deans have generously shared their collection with the public for purposes of study, research, and education. Selections from the collection have been shown at the Royal Academy of Arts in London, Musée d'Orsay in France, um, Philadelphia Art Museum, and the 1990 Garry Kasparov versus Anatoly Karpov World Championship amongst many other places. Um, for his book about their collection, Chess Masterpieces, 1,000 Years of Extraordinary Chess Sets, Dr. Dean received the 2011 Kramer Award for Excellence in Chess Journalism. I'm gonna introduce, doc, or, I'm sorry, Larry List right now, curator. Hi, it's uh, great to be back in St. Louis and see you all again. Um, and I'm especially happy to be able to introduce Dr. Dean, uh, who, because he couldn't attend the opening of the show, has become a mythic figure. Uh, who is this man? Where did these beautiful things come from? And so now at last, sort of, uh, we have Dr. Dean here in the house. I met Dr. Dean over a decade ago when he brought a community of chess set collectors that he had organized for a visit to another chess-related art show that I'd done. And I learned that Dr. Dean sort of uh, lived in Detroit. He um, married his high school sweetheart the same year he enrolled in medical school. And in the next four years, while going to medical school, he worked multiple jobs, four or more at a time. He produced 4.0 grade point average. And along with Vivian, he produced four wonderful children. And they have gone on to produce, I first thought, 12 grandchildren. So I did the math. 4 plus 12 is 16. That's one side of a set of chess pieces. But I was informed that the math is now goofed up because they now have 15 wonderful grandchildren. It's even better and stuff. And Dr. Dean sort of created both a family and a family practice and focused his medical sort of uh, knowledge on practicing sort of like holistically into treating not just one patient but the whole family and he's gone on to treat as many as four generations of the same families in the Detroit area which I think is a great thing. He also went on to create other communities, other families such as the American Board of Family Practice. He lobbied to create departments for family medicine at both Wayne State University and the University of Michigan. He endowed the George Dean MD Family Medicine Chair at the University of Michigan and uh, also sort of endowed a gallery at the Detroit Institute of Art uh, sort of because of his wife Vivian's uh, active engagement with the, the Institute and their collection. 
And so, well, why am I emphasizing all these things? Well, because with their interest in families and communities, is it any wonder that George and Vivian Dean would collect artworks that are families and communities, chess sets? But uh, no one can tell you better how and why the Deans collect chess sets than Dr. Dean himself. So please welcome a great collector and a true friend, Dr. George Dean. Welcome and thank you for coming out this, e this afternoon. Uh, I want to thank Shannon for her introduction and Larry and they just gave my lecture. So are there any questions? <laughs> no, uh, I want to really thank Larry for curating this wonderful show and Shannon and Ellie and uh, Maggie for uh, their work in creating the show. Without them, this show could never have. And Emily was very helpful in everything that we've done. I want to also pay tribute to uh, Rex and to Jeannie, who have created this wonderful complex here in St. Louis, making St. Louis really the center of the chess world in the United States and perhaps in the world. So we're very happy with that. I, get, I gave this lecture to one of my patients. <laughs> I'm not kidding, it is. Uh, I gave this lecture a few months ago and a young lady came up to me after I gave the lecture and she said, Dr. Dean, I listened to your lecture intently and I found it to be superfluous. I said, well, thank you very much. I'm thinking of having it published posthumously. And she said, she said that couldn't be too soon. <laughs> We're going to take you this afternoon on an odyssey on a trip of collecting chess sets for over 35 years. However, I just lost. Can you all hear me? Yeah. I just uh, want to tell you that this all started when I was 15 and Vivian was 13. Vivian was a beautiful 13-year-old teenager. I was a pimply, gawky, awkward adolescent, and I fell in love with her immediately. She rejected me. I asked her to marry me at 15, and understandably, she refused. <laughs> I became depressed. I used to go home at night, and I would pray to God that someday I would be successful, I would be able to come back and sweep her off her feet and marry her. There was a song that was popular at that time. It was called Time After Time, and it was popularized by Frank Sinatra. And uh, every time I would hear that song, I, tears would come to my eyes like a Pavlovian dog, because I really was in love with Vivian. Well, I turned 17. She turned 15. We went to the same high school. We went to a convocation, and I sat in one row, and Vivian sat behind me. And she didn't know that I was sitting in front of her, but she fell in love with the back of my head. <laughs> and after the convocation was over, I walked out. She followed the back of my head, not knowing who I was, and she tapped me on the shoulder, and I turned around, and when I saw the look on her face, I knew that God had answered my prayers. We went steady for three years, and then when I was 20 and she was 18, before I entered medical school, we decided to get married. And the plan was that she was going to work while I went through school and support me. Well, the best laid plans of mice and men 
often go astray. We had a baby boy in the freshman year. We had another baby boy in the sophomore year. We had a baby girl in the junior year. We had another baby girl in the senior year. We had four children in three and a half years. I missed the lecture on birth control. <laughs> The Pope sent us a letter congratulating us on our fruitfulness. We're not even Catholic. Well, we lived in a very small apartment, a basement apartment, and we had to look up in a w through a window to see what was going on outside. And after four years, it really got uh, difficult because we didn't have enough room for all the kids. I found out that the Navy would move you for nothing. So I joined the Navy. <laughs> and the Navy gave me four choices where I could go to serve. And I chose, Oak, I always wanted to live in California, so I chose San Diego Naval Hospital, Oakland Naval Hospital in Oakland, California, or Camp Pendleton in Southern California. California. They sent me to Great Lakes Naval Hospital, Great Lakes, Illinois, about 200 miles from where I lived. We spent two years at Great Lakes, and after finishing our stint at Great Lakes for two years, I had another choice of where I wanted to go, and I always wanted to go to Europe. So this time I chose Rota, Spain, Marseille, France, and Malta, an Arling an island nation in the Mediterranean. They sent me to Gross Eel Naval, Naval Air Station, Gross Eel, Michigan, which is 30 miles from where I was born. <laughs> the only sea duty I saw was fishing for perch in Lake Erie. <laughs> well, after, after spending my four years in the Navy, I opened up a small family practice in a small community in southeastern Michigan. And an a, a average day for me would be to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, go to the hospital, operate, tonsillectomies, hernia repairs, pylonotocystectomies, then see an, on an average 10 patients, then go to the office, see patients till 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Then I would make house calls till about 6 or 7, go back to the office, see patients to 10, and finally get home at about 10 o'clock, go to bed at 11. And frequently, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'd get a call to deliver a baby. This went on for years, and I needed a vacation. So we decided that we would take a trip to the Middle East. And we got to the Middle East. I'm a terrible flyer. I was so tired, my circadian cycle was out of whack, I went right to sleep. My wife was energized, and her shopping gland <laughs> went into overdrive. She went right down to the boutique in the hotel. She came back about 15 minutes later, knocked on the door and said, George, I just found a wonderful chess set. Come on down to the boutique. Well, like a dutiful husband, I got up and I walked down to the boutique. And there was a Yemenite filigree chess set of gold and silver with semi-precious jewels. We had allocated $200 to get gifts for our children, family, and friends. And the look on Vivian's face told me we were gonna buy this set. I asked the proprietor, how much is it? He said $200. So we shot our wad the first night out. <coughs> then we decided that whenever we visit a country, we would buy a chess set to commemorate that trip. And we got to Rome and we bought an Italian set. Then we went to Paris and we bought a French set. 
We ended up in London, England a few years later, and we were in a hotel off of Berkeley Square, which is in the Mayfair District of London. And we took a walk one afternoon, and we happened to see a store where they sold nothing but chess sets. There were 20 sets in the window, scores of sets inside, and we walked in. The gentleman who owned this store, his name was Mackett Beeson, and he had been a pilot during World War II and fought in the Battle of Britain, and he regaled us with stories about his RAF experiences. He then told us that chess was an ancient game, nearly 2,000 years old, and that most likely, most likely it had been originated in Northwest India. And the first set was elements of the Indian Army back at the time of Alexander the Great. The game then spread to the Middle East, eventually to Europe, and now it had become the most universal of any game in the world. Every country in the world played chess, and there had been craftsmen who had been creating chess sets for 2,000 years. Not only that, there were uh, books written on it, museums had permanent collections, there were auctions, and there were collectors all over the world. So we decided that we would go on what I called a chess set safari. We would identify a country, learn how to say, do you have any antique chess sets? And we'd <laughs> fly to the country, rent a car, and drive around the country scooping up chess sets. And we go to every antique shop that we could remember. We literally went on a safari to Africa. And our guides and trackers were Maasai warriors. And they told me that there was a gentleman who lived in Kenya who had a chess set and wanted to sell it. So I said, take me to there. And this is the set that he had. He had smuggled this set out of Russia during the revolution. It was made in Austro-Hungary. It's a, it's a heraldic shield set. It's made of gold and silver. And there are six topazes in this set. And in each topaz is an engraving, an intaglio, in which the artist has carved a picture of a warrior. And it's absolutely amazing. As we traveled around the world, we managed to meet friends. Friends who became so dear to us, they would come to our house, we would visit them in their house, we would go, we would celebrate birthdays together, weddings, and this is a, a, a group of people that we have met in our travels. There's Vivian, and sitting in front of her is Don Schultz, who was, pres who was a past president of the U.S. Chess Federation, and his wife, Teresa. There's Susan Polgar, the first lady to ever have the title of Grand Master and a champion in her own right. Next to her is Anne and uh, Antonio Osario. They're Portuguese, but they live in England now, and he is president of Lloyd's of London Bank. Next to Don Schultz is Frank Brady, who was president of the Marshall Chess Club in New York, and his wife, Maxine. And standing next to me is uh, Tom Thompson from Kelkheim, Germany, a dear friend and a owner of a wonderful collection of chess sets. I'm a family doctor, and I belong to an organization called the American Academy of Family Physicians. It's 120,000 family doctors. And their office is in Kansas City, Missouri. So I've spent a lot of time 
in Kansas City because I was an officer of that organization. We were a new specialty, and I traveled around the country developing departments of family medicine and creating residencies in family medicine. Our organization meets once a year in a city in the United States where we have lectures pertinent to family medicine, where we have exhibitions of new technology and medications, and we have a political meeting discussing the politics and economics affecting family medicine. I had a great love for family medicine, and I dedicated a good part of my life to it. I also loved collecting chess sets. And I thought that maybe we could create the same paradigm for the American Academy of Family Physicians and translate that into an organization for collectors of chess sets. So I sent a letter to everybody in the world that collected chess sets. And I said, let's meet in Palm Air in Pompano Beach, Florida, and let's get together for a social visit and see how we like each other. Well, 40 brave, intrepid, adventurous collectors came to Palm Air Country Club and Spa in 1984, in April of that year. And in order to enhance the experience, I contacted the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, which has a wonderful collection of chess sets. And I was able to talk them into loaning me 20 of their sets, which I could exhibit. Now that's the first time, and probably the last time, they ever loaned any work of art to an individual and not an institution. I also called the Philadelphia Museum of Art, which has a wonderful collection donated by John Harbison of Philadelphia. And they loaned me 10 of their sets. And we met and we had a great time. We heard lectures. We supplemented the exhibition with sets from our collection. And we had dinners together. And in the end, we decided that we would create an organization. And we called it Chess Collectors International. And here are some gentlemen that were at that first meeting. Victor Keats from uh, London, England, Ernst Bolin from Bern, Switzerland, David Haffler, and myself. I was elected president, and I created this publication and sent it out to everybody in the world that I knew that collected chess sets. And at the next meeting we had, we had 100 people at that. I was able as president to speak at the United Nations talking about how chess and chess sets and chess collecting could bring harmony to the countries of the world. We also, I spoke in front of the British Parliament. They had a room they had allocated just for chess playing and chess sets, and they were very interested in chess also. Our next meeting was in London, England, and that was done in collaboration with the Victoria and Albert Museum, and we had 100 people at that meeting. Then we eventually had a meeting in St. Petersburg, Russia, and we collaborated with the Hermitage Museum, and they had a wonderful collection of chess sets. And eventually we would end up in Berlin, Germany, and we went to the Pergamon Museum. Our organization has grown to hundreds and hundreds of people. At the same time, we tried to interest academicians and historians to study chess and study the history of chess and chess sets as an art form. And we were able to contact the University of Cambridge, which did this research and published articles in jury journals all over the world. Gary Gasparov, who was here for a few minutes and has left, has collaborated with our organization. Anatoly Karpov is an honorary member of our organization. Yoko Ono, 
a producer of chess sets, is also an honorary member. <clears throat> Lothar Schmidt, who was a grandmaster and was the referee for the Spassky Fisher match in Reykjavik in 1972, was a member of our organization and a great collector of books on chess and chess sets. And Arnold Denker, an American champion, attended our first meeting and did a simultaneous at that meeting. In 1977, we received a call from some Russian immigrants who had just come to the United States. They heard that I collected chess sets. And they said, we have a Fabergé chess set. Would you like to see it? Vivian and I got in our car and drove to Chicago, where we lived. The chess set was of silver and silver gilt, and the motif was Assyrians versus Egyptians. On each piece was Fabergé and the Kukushnik that showed that this was sterling silver and the initials of the master who made this set. Now Fabergé had hundreds of people who made our items for him, but only about 10 of them were of such a high, a high level of beauty that they were allowed to put their initials on the works that they created. And this is the gentleman who made that chess set. Yarmel Armfelt is his name. The set came in a box, an oak box, with a silk lining. And embossed on the silk lining was Fabergé, Petrograd, Moscow, London. Now, I was a little spooked by this because I knew that Fabergé started his workshop in, 19, in 1884 and was jeweler and goldsmith to the Tsars from 19, 1884 to 1916. But in 1914, Russia went to war with Germany. Peter the Great created, moved his capital from Moscow to the banks of the Neva River in 1711. He was a Germanophile. He loved everything German, and he wanted to be as close to Germany as possible. And he called his city St. Petersburg, which is a German name. Well, the Russians were incensed. They were fighting a war against Germany, and their capital city had a German name, so they changed the name to Petrograd. I now knew that this set had to be made after 1914. Well, Fabergé's workshop was from 1884 to 1916. And he was involved in the war work to prepare for the war against Germany. So I was a little spooked and I wasn't sure about the authenticity of this set. So I asked, we were going to London, and I asked them, the Russians, <coughs> whether we could take a few pieces to London and have it authenticated by the world's authority on Fabergé, a gentleman by the name of Kenneth Snowman. And they agreed. Kenneth Snowman was the jeweler to the queen, Queen Elizabeth II. And she was celebrating her 25th jubilee, her 25th anniversary on the throne of England. She uh, had a beautiful collection of Fabergé. And that collection was an exhibit at the Victoria and Albert Museum. I'll never forget the day that we went to his shop, which is Wartsky's, and it's on Grafton Street at the head of Bond Street in London. England is high up on the latitude of the world, close to the Arctic Circle, so it gets dark very early. And this was in November, and it was pitch black. 
that day we went there. And it was raining and foggy. And we walked into the shop and I said, Kenneth, here are several pieces that are purported to be Fabergé. What do you think? And he looked at him and he said, I don't know about these pieces, but serendipitously, I just put into my cabinet the only Fabergé set that I know about. It's been an exhibition at the Victorian Albert Museum. The owner wants to capitalize on the notoriety, and I have it there. I said, could we see it? He said, sure. He took us into his exhibition room, and there was the set. Vivian and I had known about this set. We'd read about it. We'd seen pictures, but I never dreamt that I would be in a position to see it in the flesh, let alone buy it. It was made of Calgon Jasper, Aventurine Quartz, Siberian Jade, Apricot Serpentine, mounted in a silver board. I, we held hands as we watched this set, and I said, I bit the inside of my mouth so I wouldn't seem too enthusiastic, and very casually I said, you know I'd like to buy that set. And he said, I don't want to sell it. I said, you don't want to sell it. You're a businessman. This is your business, your shop. You've got it exhibited. He said, you know what? I just put it in this case 15 minutes ago. You're the first people that have ever seen it. I've got clients all over the world that would love to buy this. Well, it took me an hour. I finally convinced them to sell the set to me. I said, I'm going to write you a check. Whatever you ask for, I'm going to write it in the check, and I'm going to be back. In 10 days, we're going to Edinburgh, we're going to Dublin, you'll pack the set up and we'll take it home. The set came in a box, an oak box, similar to the other set, and embossed on the lining, which was pigskin, not silk, was Fabergé, St. Petersburg. Moscow and Odessa. And it had the crown and the crest of the Romanov dynasty, the double eagle. This indicated that the royal family and the Tsar was involved in the commission of this set, one of the great sets of the world. The set has a great history. This gentleman is Alexei Nikolaevich Kuropotkin. He's a great Russian general. He won many battles for Russia in the Crimea, against Turkey. In 1904 and 1905, Russia was fighting a war in Manchuria with Japan. It was called the Russo-Japanese War or the Manchurian War. And he was minister of war in the Tsar's cabinet. The Tsar went to Kuropotkin and said, we're losing the war in, in uh, Manchuria. I want you to resign as minister of war and go to Manchuria and win the war. He obeyed his commander and he resigned, went to Manchuria. History tells us they lost the war. Japan bloodied their nose. It was the beginning of the downfall of the Roman Empire, the Romanov Empire. Kuropotkin was a chess player. He returned to St. Petersburg very depressed. And because he was so depressed, the Tsar and the Romanov family decided to commission a chess set to buoy his spirits. And along the border of the silver board was to our dearly beloved Nikolai Nikolaevich Kuropotkin for his faithful duty in Manchuria, 1904-1905. Well, we got home, and you might ask, what happened to the set from the Russians? I called up the Russians, and I said, Folks, I'm not interested in your set anymore. Why? Well, I happened to buy a Fabergé set, and 
we can't afford to buy your set. So we returned the set to the German, to the Russians. Three years later, they put this set into auction at Sotheby's. And by the way, Kenneth Snowman wrote a letter authenticating this set as a Fabergé set. Three years later, this gentleman purchased the set, David Haffler, a very dear friend of mine and a collector of chess sets, of great chess sets. Unfortunately, David developed Parkinsonism. In 2003, he passed away. On his deathbed, he said, I want Vivian and George to have this set. So now both of these sets are in our collection. Fabergé created 200,000 beautiful items of art and only two chess sets. Our collection grew to nearly a thousand items and we began to donate sets to the Mary Hill Museum, which is in the state of Washington on the edge of the gorge of the Columbia River, to the Detroit Institute of Art, and to the World Chess Hall of Fame. And here are Jeannie and Rex Singfell. And once again, I commend them on their de dedication, devotion, and benevolence to the game of chess. In 2011, I wrote a book called Chess Masterpieces. The US Chess Federation gives an award called the Kramer Award each year to the book that they think is the best written on chess, and that book was given that award, and I spoke at the U.S. Chess Federation meeting in uh, Orlando. Here I am signing the book. Vivian and I will celebrate our 65th wedding anniversary in three months. And here's our family. Wow. They've grown. We have 15 grandchildren. We have three great-grandchildren with one on the way in about three months. We were honored at a banquet in Detroit. And uh, I asked for a distinguished speaker to come to that banquet and speak. And because of the proximity to a recent event occurring in the United States, I want to point out to you who the guest speaker was. The 43rd President of the United States, George W. Bush. Well, a movie producer in Hollywood that made documentaries who also uh, was read my book and was thought it would make a wonderful documentary, asked if they could make a documentary about it. And we do have excerpts from that book of sets that are in the exhibition. And I would like to now show you that. In 1962, I was a practicing family physician. I'd been working seven days a week, 24 hours a day for five or six years, and I took the first vacation that I'd taken since we got married. We took a trip to the Middle East. We had $200 that were allocated for gifts for our children, friends, and family. And then when we got to Israel, that was our first part of the trip, I saw a chess set. It was beautiful, and I just fell in love with it. I asked him to buy it. He really didn't want to because we didn't have a whole lot of money, and he didn't want it, and I kept driving him nuts, so he finally relented and we bought that set. It was Vivian who found the first set. 
and then decided that we would buy a set to commemorate every trip that we took. And then we started to go on the chess set safaris. We went to places that were pretty dangerous and pretty exciting. And uh, we had some marvelous times. We had some scary times. I didn't know how to play chess. It just, these are gorgeous and very interesting pieces. A chess set is 32 pieces of beautiful sculpture. These are works of art. They have great history behind them. And I love history. If I wouldn't have got into medical school, I would have gotten a PhD in history and art history. Because of George's love of history, he would talk about what was going on at the time of a certain set that was a historical type of set. And it made it into a wonderful living thing for me. There are several ways of looking at chess sets. Obviously, one is the culture they come from, but often related to that are the materials that are being used. They come in ivory, cloth, ceramics, metal, wood, anything that's mainly carvable. There are as many ways of depicting chess pieces as the human imagination can possibly create, and it varies enormously uh, depending on the society, uh, where it was made, and when it was made. The oldest set we have is from 1525, but we do have individual pieces that were found in Egyptian tombs from 3,000 years ago. The impetus behind these sets uh, vary enormously, from a beautifully crafted gift from one wealthy, powerful individual to another, to sets that have very, very specific political purposes. Some of them people might indeed categorize as the fine arts and the way sculpture is, but I consider them really design objects more because there is so much design to the playing of chess and what one's intentions are, and in turn the design of form must reflect the power that the different pieces have. I've seen most of the major chess set collections in the world, and the Dean's is really a very, very impressive collection. This is a set that was commissioned. I was just so amazed by the different sets and all the little stories that go with them. Abyssinian War. I traveled in over 50 countries, not as many as uh, with George and Vivian, but also quite a few, and I've seen quite a few chess sets myself. Uh, they really picked out the jewels from each place and each culture and historical time. It was made in Hanau, Germany. It allows me to utilize my love of history and my love of art and combine the two. And that's what we're always looking for in a set. The Fabergé set is a very interesting example of uh, a presentation piece. When we think of Fabergé, we think of the eggs and these complicated things with tiny, tiny little details when the eggs open up coaches and horses and those kinds of things. Fabergé didn't make everything himself, but he had a workshop. Fabergé created about 200,000 items in his factory and only two of them were chess sets, and we have both of them in our collection. As was the case with many of the Fabergé objects, 
they were made as gifts, basically for the, the imperial family to give to one another. This one was made as a gift to the commander-in-chief of the Russian army, Alexei Kuropatkin. The history of the set is that in 1904 and 1905, Russia was at war with Japan in Manchuria. They both were industrial powers, and they both wanted to add Manchuria to their empire. Nikolai Kurpotkin was the Minister of Defense in Tsar Nicholas's cabinet. And Tsar Nicholas told him, I want you to resign as Minister of Defense, and I want you to go to Manchuria and win the war for us. Well, he resigned. He went to Manchuria. History tells us they lost the war. They, the Japanese bloodied their noses. It was the downfall of the Romanov dynasty. Kropotkin went back to St. Petersburg. He was very depressed because he had lost the war. He was a chess player. And the royal family, the Romanov family, and the generals commissioned Fabergé to create this set for Kropotkin. It is made of Calgon Jasper, Aventurine Quartz, Siberian Jade, and Apricot Serpentine, mounted in a board of silver. The Fabergé uh, set is remarkable in a way in its restraint. This is relatively straightforward, this beautiful, simple carving of the stones uh, with the silver details and the elaborate uh, surround to the base. And along the perimeter of the board in the Cyrillic alphabet is to our dearly beloved commander for his faithful duty in Manchuria, Alexei Nikolaevich Kuropatkin, 1904-1905, and all the names of the generals that served with them. They all had their names inscribed around the border, a list of a number of princely families of Russia. You could really write a history book about the people on that board. Alexei Kuropatkin led the Russian forces in the absolute disastrous Russo-Japanese war. The whole imperial fleet was sunk, uh, the imperial army was absolutely routed in Manchuria, and this was given to him um, as a reward uh, for his work as commander-in-chief. I, I, I would love to be rewarded for that kind of failure myself. The Fabergé set has been exhibited all over the world. It is probably one of the most famous sets in the world, if not the most famous. This is a crystal set made by the Val St. Lambert Crystal Company, which resides in Brussels. It is a Art Deco set made of clear crystal on one side and green crystal on the other. Colored and clear glass mixed together, showing the technique, the sort of avant-garde Art Deco style that that firm was popularizing in other works in glass, and it sort of was a pièce de résistance of glass work. It was exhibited at an exhibition in Paris in the Palais Royal during the 1920s, and it is one of the most beautiful and elegant chess sets of the 20th century. Salvador Dali began his career as a Dadist. The Dadists looked to the external world for their inspiration. But after World War I, 
Dali then became a surrealist. The surrealists looked internally. They were influenced by Freudian psychology. Salvador Dali, one of the absolutely archetypal surrealists, uh, created a set uh, that he dedicated to Marcel Duchamp because of Duchamp's uh, great love of the game. Um, and he used his own thumb and his own digits uh, to create the pieces. And what he did was he took his fingers and his thumbs and took imprints of them and made casts of his fingers and thumbs. He had lost a tooth when he was three years old, and he kept it, and he took that tooth and put it on top of the king. He took his wife Gala's index finger and used that as the queen and put the tooth on top of that piece. This was made at a time when Dali was really uh, pushing the boundaries of what was commercial and what was fine art. He took imprints of his nipples, placed them on top of a salt and pepper shaker, and made those his rooks. His pawns were those of his thumbs. That is a total Salvador Dali surrealist idea to think of these fingers and thumbs wandering around the chessboard. So that is his art, not abstract. This is part of an episode in an artist's life uh, when he was looking at all kinds of different things that could be art and, and making a chess set. It was also, in a way, a riposte uh, to the very, very um, high-minded abstraction uh, that was dominating American art at that time. Dali's way of doing something that has almost an edge of triviality to it. One of the most popular sets was created by Max Esser, who was chairman of the Department of Art at Berlin University in 1922. It is called the Sea Life Set. The Sea Life Set was made by Meissen, the manufactory that had discovered how to make porcelain back in the 18th century. It's a wonderful, whimsical piece. It was made in the 1920s. It has a little tinge of the Art Deco to it. It is made up of a board with convoluted edges representing the waves of the sea. Beneath the waves of the sea are porcelain pieces representing the denizens of the sea. The king and queen are sea anemones. The bishops are lobsters. The knights are seahorses. The rooks are octopi or cuttlefish. And all the pawns are starfish. This board's a good example of where the art of the board and the chess set came together by the same designer. It shows how decorative arts uh, come and go in significance in the history of art and in art movements. And the 1920s uh, was one of those times when design and those kinds of things really came to the fore. The Meissen Porcelain Company had been making chess sets for Frederick the Great and others in the 18th century, and they're still making them today. This set is being made today by the Meissen Company, but it is very difficult to create this set because of the expanse of the board, which is very brittle, and for each board that they make, 10 of them will break and only the 11th one will remain intact. This set was made in the Austro-Hungarian Empire during the early 19th century. It is made of uranium oxide and gold oxide. 
Uranium oxide is a form of uranium found and mined in Central Europe and has a very beautiful chartreuse color. It is called sometimes uranium glass. This set was made during the Biedermeier period. The Biedermeier period followed the Napoleonic Wars from 1815 till about 1840 and it characterized the lifestyle of people following these wars where they became more subdued and less flamboyant compared to the reign of Napoleon. The set sits on a stone board with marble inlaid which is called Pietra Dura and is contemporaneous with the set but originates in India. It is the type of work that one would find if you visited the Taj Mahal in Agra in India. This is a Russian set made in the 18th century of amber. Amber is a material or a resin that comes from a tree that fell along the Baltic coast 40 million years ago. The resin seeped out of the tree and then the sediment created a stone-like material called amber, which is really organic. Amber was very much used in Russia, in the Baltic states that surround Scandinavia, northern Germany, Poland, and so on. In 1760, Catherine the Great was the Tsarina of all the Russias. Catherine the Great was in love with Amber. In fact, she created an Amber Room in her southern palace. This set was made in the workshop of Catherine the Great. On one side, the amber is translucent. On the other, it is opaque. The queen on the translucent side is Catherine the Great, and it's a portrait of her and her lover and minister, Gregory Potomkin. And the opposite side is her son, Paul I, who was successor to her throne and wanted to have her abdicate and become Tsar of Russia before her death. His queen is his wife. It's very hard to carve amber to the degree of sophistication and detail that you can carve ivory. The board is also made of amber and there are plaques around each side which have symbols of the Russian Empire. It is a stunning, magnificent set that is jewel-like. This is an Italian set created in the 18th century, made of insects, one side being ivory and the other side being ebony. Each piece represents a certain species and has the scientific name in Latin written in the base of the piece. The king and the queen are butterflies. There are caterpillars, crickets, and moths on both sides. It is a very popular set. It's one that most people are intrigued with because of the uniqueness of a chess set using insects as pieces in the set.
This set was made in Delhi in India in the 18th century, showing Indians versus the English forces. The English controlled India and exploited India. Soldiers were sent to India in order to preserve and maintain order and to protect the East Indian trade. The soldiers that served would spend about 10 or 15 years in India, and then when they would return to England, they would like memorabilia of their stay in India, and they would commission a set in Delhi. They would take these sets, bring them back to England, and put them in their curio cases on a glass shelf to commemorate their time spent in India. It was purely a decorative set. It was never made to play with because it is so intricate and so delicately carved. This set is beautifully carved of ivory. It is one of the most sought after sets in the world. The elephants are dominant and in the Russian language, the bishop is called an elephant. The same word as they use for elephant, uh, slon. So it's, it's kind of interesting to see how different cultures use different names for the pieces. It is an extraordinary set in that there are four extra pieces, two chariots and two juggernauts. The purpose of these four extra pieces was to just enhance the beauty of it. This is unique among Delhi sets and increases the value and importance of this set. This set was made in Persia during the 17th century. It is silver and silver gilt, and the board is also silver and silver gilt. Islamic sets are geometric, non-representational, and abstract. Islamic sets pose another very interesting aspect for chess set collectors because the general rule, although not necessarily specified in the Quran, is no figural representation. And so these are generally abstract sets. Most of them tend to have mushroom-shaped forms in varying heights. This Persian set is an essay in a kind of abstraction. And when you look at these pieces carefully, uh, you see that they are in some ways almost identical. The only thing that separates the king, the queen from the pawn and the castle is their scale, their size, their relationship to one another. So you actually understand what the pieces are by seeing them only alongside the other pieces. But then when you look more carefully, you can see that these pieces are very, very carefully worked. They have absolutely beautiful craftsman-like details, uh, both in the pieces themselves and the board also. Islamic sets do lead us to 20th century abstractionism, and that makes it, in a way, easier for us to read 20th century sets. This set was created in France in 1525. It is one of the most beautiful and important chess sets in the world. The pieces are rock crystal and smoky topaz, trimmed with silver and silver gilt. They sit on a board of alternating squares of rock crystal and smoky topaz. And under each square is a foil of silver and gold. They are mounted into a board of bronze, and at each corner is a turtle, which is symbolic of the slowness of the game of chess. It's a very early set and reflects the idea that rock crystal was a highly prized 
uh, material and so very precious and it's extraordinary that it also has its board that goes with it which is a really remarkable feature. Frequently chess sets were made without boards on the grounds that you would use a fairly standard board. On the bottom of the board is written Louis XIV. The Louvre has a set similar to this on loan from the Cluny Museum in Paris. Unfortunately, there are only 31 pieces in the Louvre set because Louis XVIII lost the Queen early on in the 19th century. This set has all 32 pieces. Well, I want to thank you all for coming this afternoon. I've had a lot to say. You've had a lot to listen to. I hope we finished all at the same time. The nature of the set in any way affect your game? And if so, how? Well, we do play with every one of these sets one time. And then we put it on the shelf and we never play with it again. Uh, I have given up playing chess. And I play golf now. <laughs> so I'm not playing at this present time. Multiple questions. One, do you collect golf balls? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I lose them in the water. Competition <laughs> um, is there when a set comes on the market? Tremendous competition. <laughs> so you did it to yourself. John Harbison. I was a great collector in Philadelphia. And in 1979, he put up his collection at auction at Sotheby's. And Victor Keats and Ernst Bolin and myself were going to form a ring. <laughs> a ring is something where we all get together and we bid to keep the price down of the sets. These two guys are really aggressive. And we sat down for dinner, and in about 15 minutes, each one of them was at each other's throat. <laughs> and I said, boys, I'm not getting involved, and I walked away. So there is competition. There's no question about it. David and I, David Haffler, used to go to auctions. And I remember one auction, we both wanted a set, but we were not going to bid against each other. So we flipped a coin, David won, and he bought the set. Does your wife still have any input into chess purchases? She, she has input into everything. <laughs> <laughs> we never buy anything without both agreeing to it. And she's very proud of the, the chess set. Why you selected that location? Because the director of that museum was very interested in chess and exhibiting chess sets. Most of the great museums of the world have, have collections of chess sets, but they relegate them to their basement in boxes and they don't display them. Mary Hill Museum has a special room with chess sets and every chess set that's donated is exhibited there. I, I'll be going to Portland a lot. You, lot you should be Thank take you. a ride over there. Yes, I definitely. It'd be very Thank interesting. You. Thank you very much once again. I hope you enjoyed. <laughs>